Her ancestors were enslaved by the Creek Indians and her family lived in poverty. But by the time she turned 18, Sarah Rector would be living an extravagant lifestyle with a net worth of $28 million in today's currency. And it all came by accident. Who knew that the rocky, undesirable land given to her by the federal government would make her the richest black girl in America? Early in the 19th century, while the rapidly growing United States expanded into the Southeast, white settlers pressured the U.S. government to force the Indian nations to relocate to land west of the Mississippi. They held the strong belief that the Indian nations were standing in the way of progress, resulting in a deadly and savage campaign to acquire over 25 million acres of fertile land in the South from the Native Americans. American colonists were eager for more and more land to grow cotton, thereby producing a need for more and more Africans for slave labor. The five civilized tribes, which included the Creek, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Seminole nations, ultimately surrendered their ancestral homeland in the Southeast after it became apparent that they could not physically protect their homeland against a more formidable opponent in the U.S. military forces. Nor could they win legally after suffering defeats in the Supreme Court and becoming the target of new legislation such as the Indian Removal Act of 1830. They were all forced into new treaties with the federal government, which would push them out to what was deemed Indian territory, land west of the Mississippi. This ethnic cleansing and series of forced displacements would become known as the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears is over 5,000 miles long and covers nine states, Alabama, Arkansas, Georgia, Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, North Carolina, Oklahoma, and Tennessee. The large caravans and sometimes small groups of indigenous people suffered from exposure, disease, and starvation while walking the trail barefoot and at gunpoint to their newly designated Indian Reserve. This journey was severely mismanaged by the federal troops. There was a shortage of supplies and troops rushed the Indians onward, refusing to allow them to minister to their sick or bury their dead. Between 1830 and 1850, the U.S. government brutally and heartlessly removed over 100,000 Native Americans from their homelands in the southern states. It is estimated that a quarter of the Native Americans who started out on the walk perished during the treacherous march westward or passed away shortly after arriving in the completely foreign land. The Trail of Tears is just another horrifying episode in the series of key events that make up American history. But how this story intersects with the life of Sarah Rector can further be explained. The chief of Creek Indians, Apothli Yohole, managed to lead approximately 8,000 of his tribe members from Alabama to what was called the Unassigned Lands. He himself held enslaved Africans as workers for his plantations in Alabama. And with hopes of starting anew with prosperous farms out west, Yohole brought his slaves with him. One of his slaves was Molly, Sarah Rector's paternal great-grandmother. And fate would have it that she survived the calamitous journey. Molly married Benjamin McQueen, who was also enslaved by another Creek Indian. They were blessed with the son that they named Jack Benjamin, but for some reason unknown, he changed his name to John Richter after returning from the Civil War, where he served with the Union Army's 83rd U.S. Colored Troop Infantry. Shockingly, even though the Civil War abolished slavery across the nation in 1865, that didn't include Indian territory. It wasn't until 1866 that a treaty forced Native Americans to abolish slavery and allowed Creeks and their freed slaves or freedmen to become United States citizens. At the time, the five civilized tribes included 10,000 enslaved African Americans who were not only newly freed U.S. citizens, but they were also classified as citizens with full rights of the respective tribes who had previously enslaved them. Keep this in mind because this will become very important. At the turn of the century, the federal government started eyeballing land in the Indian territories to form the new statehood of Oklahoma. Again, the U.S. government would exploit the Indian nations and would enact new legislation to disenfranchise them of their land and culture. As part of the Dawes Allotment Act and Curtis Act, the federal government sought to break up the traditional leadership of the five civilized tribes out west. This would produce negative cultural and social effects in a vicious attempt to detribalize the Native Americans. 
the U.S. government also started to regulate tribal territories by converting traditional systems of land tenure into a government-imposed system of private property by forcing Native Americans to individually accept land allotments, which previously did not exist in their cultures. Through this system of exploitation, the federal government was able to systematically reduce the Native Americans' control over 100 million acres of land down to 20 million through its implementation of these individual allotments. Qualified full-blooded members of the Creek Indian tribe were eligible for an allotment of 160 acres. According to the treaty, all freedmen born into slavery who were classified as citizens of the Creek Indian tribe were also eligible for an allotment of 160 acres. John Rector and his wife Betty, along with other Creek freedmen, chose to merge their allotments to form their own town of newly freed African Americans that they voted to call Taft in 1904. It was quite impressive that this small, determined group of freedmen with no formal education was able to build this bustling early 20th century town that had two newspapers, three general stores, a brickyard, drugstore, a soda pop factory, a livery stable, grist mill, two hotels, a restaurant, a bank, and a funeral home, all before 1910. Sitting 45 miles southeast of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Taft today is one of the only 13 all-black towns still in existence in Oklahoma. At the time, it was one of 50 settlements founded by freedmen. John and Betty Rector would be blessed with the son that they named Joseph. Joseph Rector ended up marrying Rose Jackson, one of the girls who also grew up in the small town of Taft. By 1907, the two were living in a two-room cabin on a dirt road outside of Taft, on Rose's land of allotment with three children of their own, Becky, Sarah, and Joe Jr. Working to overcome poverty, Joseph farmed corn and cotton on Rose's acres while the kids watched the trains come and go from the Midland Valley Railroad Station. Born on March 3, 1902, Sarah Rector and her siblings were part of the last batch of enrolled members of the Creek Freedmen Miners who were granted 160 acres of land before Oklahoma was admitted as a state. By the time they had their chance to claim their allotment as rightful citizens of the Creek Indian tribe, the pickings were slim. Her sister Becky's land was in another county, 50 miles away, while Sarah and her baby brother Joe Jr.'s land ended up 50 miles northwest of Taft. Sarah's land was near a bend along the Cimarron River, valued at around $500. Like most of the land allotments to the Creek Indians and freedmen, her land was rocky, barren, and unsuitable for farming, while the more attractive, arable lands were sold to white settlers and land speculators. Sarah's parents, Joseph and Rose, were forced to pay a land tax of $30 per year on their daughter's property. This was a burden that became so great that Joseph attempted to sell Sarah's land. He was blocked by doing so by state law, which forbade the sale of lands belonging to minors. Since her parents could not sell the land due to the government-imposed restriction, Joseph was looking for ways to leverage the land in order to cover the property taxes. He was aware that the Indian Territory was starting to attract a lot of attention, but did not know that it was starting to become one of the country's biggest oil producers. New drillers and oil companies were flocking into Oklahoma by the dozens hoping to get lucky. Knowing this, Joseph felt it wise to lease out the land to B.B. Jones, an independent oil company who would start oil exploration on the land in 1911. In August 1913, the independent driller started core drilling on Sarah's land and soon struck oil. B.B. Jones produced a gusher on that land that quickly produced 2,500 barrels or 105,000 gallons of black gold every single day. Sarah received the typical royalty deal of 12.5%, netting her upwards of $8,000 per day in today's currency. By 1915, Rector's assigned land was producing hundreds of thousands of barrels of crude oil per month, and her daily income was more than the yearly salary for most Americans. Sarah Rector's story spread across the country, and her name was splashed across national headlines, both white and black presses. Newspaper headlines read, The Richest Negro Girl in the World girls $112,000 a year. And Negro girl rich from oil has income of $475 daily. As a result of Rector's fame, she naturally started receiving all kinds of requests for loans, donations, and even marriage proposals. Rector was 13 years old and legally could not manage her own estate. Her guardian, 
a white man appointed by a probate judge named T.J. Porter, controlled all of Sarah's financial affairs, although both of her parents were alive. Stories started to circulate that T.J. Porter was taking advantage of the Rector family. Rumors sensationalized stories that Sarah and her family continued to live in extreme poverty, while her white guardian lived a luxurious life. Soon, the NAACP and W.E.B. Dubois himself got involved, hoping to verify the story and rectify any injustice done to Sarah. Dubois is said to have written directly to the county judge who oversaw Rector's affairs for more information. The local judge wrote back and confirmed that Porter received less than 2% of Sarah's total income, that the Rectors lived in a new, fully furnished five-room cottage, and that Sarah and her sister were set to attend the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. This was a boarding school for teenagers run by Booker T. Washington. Since people were always trying to take advantage of Sarah, her family secretly slipped away and moved north to Kansas City in 1917, likely in order to escape scrutiny and not wanting to be the target of some kidnapping. Now a teenager, Sarah's net worth was estimated to be greater than $1 million, over $28 million in today's currency. Her wealth was being generated between oil fields and 2,000 acres of farmland in Oklahoma, as well as numerous business investments in Kansas City. By 1918, there were 50 oil wells on Sarah's land, and with each new contract, she was awarded a $300,000 signing bonus. Mama Rose, as her mother was called, was in charge of Sarah's money until she would become old enough to control it on her own. With all the hype surrounding her luck, eventually Rector attracted the attention of men across the globe and even suitors as far away as Germany. Rector married her husband, Kenneth Campbell, a former college football player she met in Kansas City. He focused on real estate development and their car dealership in the city. The couple reveled in their position as local royalty, driving fancy cars and hosting Joe Lewis, Duke Ellington, and Count Basie in their mansion. After a few years of marriage, the couple gave birth to three children, Kenneth Campbell Jr., Leonard Campbell, and Clarence Campbell. However, Richter divorced her husband in 1930. The stock market crash in 1929 set the stage for a nationwide depression that destroyed a myriad number of millionaires. The Rectors were no different. Extensive land holdings in Oklahoma, bonds now worth nothing, and depleting oil royalties marked the end of their extravagant spending habits. To be clear, Sarah still had quite a bit of money, but she had to cut back significantly on her spending and lavish lifestyle. Her siblings all took on jobs. Her mother even for a time went back to working as a maid. Sarah married her second husband, William Crawford, and lived a relatively quiet life. He was the owner of Dick's Down Home Cook Shop, a favorite hangout of the Kansas City Monarchs baseball team. Mama Rose died in 1957, and Sarah passed in 1967 at the age of 65 from a cerebral hemorrhage. Her final resting place in the ground was back where the story begins, in Taft, in a peaceful parcel of land known as Black Jack Cemetery. The Rector Mansion in Kansas City still stands today, and her family never left. Five generations of Rector's descendants still call Kansas City home. Sarah Rector thrived during decades in which her status as a wealthy black child, and later black woman, helped her and her family live a life that most African Americans, both now and then, can only begin to dream about. <laughs>